utter emptiness. I read these books. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> but they moved me. I couldn't get them out of my mind, out of my heart. So as I became a couple years older, I started to read. And um, I started to become interested in Eastern thought, Eastern philosophy, not religion. The philosophy that's looking at the question, who am I? And why am I here? What's my purpose? These questions were very important to me as a youth. And finally I came to hear some of the teachings about these questions, particularly the who am I, on a deeper level, uh, to be very satisfying, though difficult to understand, from the Buddhist teachings that I received. And I slowly found out that Buddhism, in one way, is not really a religion. It's more a science of the mind. Okay. Um, it's certainly not theistic. There's no belief in a creator God. Okay. Um, there is kind of a notion of a God, but that one is here. It's kind of our own potential, the, the potential of our own minds, which is infinite. Now, the field of Buddhism has three parts. One is what we call the science of the mind, which is like psychology. It's recognizing our emotions and recognizing the destructive nature of our aggressive emotions and learning to work to reduce and eventually eliminate them. It's very much like psychology. In America, there's a, probably the most popular uh, psychology journal read by the general public and psychologists, both, is called Psychology Today. If you look at one of their issues, um, you find that many of the articles are taking Buddhist principles of psychology and applying them to psychotherapy, not calling them Buddhist, calling them humanistic, something that resonates as good advice, good methodology for psychotherapy. The second section of Buddhism is philosophy, philosophy of reality. The reality of ourself, who am I? I mean deeply, who am I? And the philosophy of uh, the the physical world, the macro world, the universe, and the micro way, the, sorry, the micro world of the subatomic world. And what is it? And what kind of principles are, are operating on these large levels of galaxy and solar systems and planets? and on the micro world of the atom, of the protons, neutrons, electrons, and now leptons and all these other quarks and these other subatomic particles. And now they supposedly, uh, in CERN, in, in, uh, near the border, but in Switzerland, found last year the Higgs boson which is one of these subatomic particles that seems to be some kind of a field that when other pre-particles becoming particles pass through, they gain mass. So all these things have some explanation in Buddhist philosophy. For about nearly 30 years, 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama with the beautiful smile with Mother Teresa. He's been dialoguing with scientists once or twice a year, often with, with uh, quantum physicists. David Bohm, who's now passed, uh, was a dear, dear friend. Francesco Varela, who was a neuro, brain scientist, also a philosopher, a phenomenologist, and also a, a Buddhist, was very close friend of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who considers everyone his friend. Everyone. It doesn't matter where you live, if it's in the West, in the East, in Asia, in China, regardless, everyone is his friend. Okay. Um, so the dialogue between his holdings, by the way, he very much pays attention to his physical health. Every day, he spends a half an hour or more on this treadmill. He's doing some of his practice you can see him kind of engrossed inward doing some of his practice while he works out on the treadmill. This is in his home in Dharmasala. Okay. The third area is kind of like religion. I mean, there is something like religion in Buddhism. It's the prayers the pujas, uh, it's the rituals, okay? Now, you can see that Buddhism is based more on reason, on logic, um, and less on blind faith, okay? Now, what happens to a Buddhist after he or she practices for many years you develop an inner experience. And that experience has a conviction. You know it's correct. And that's kind of a reasoned type of faith, based on reason, based on study, based on reflection, based on debate. We'll have to go through the whole series to come back to that. But the first slide is showing His Holiness the Dalai Lama debating. He even has his Zen outer garment tied around his waist because he's very active. You know, he's going like this. And it's a debate back and forth. And this photo, which will come at the beginning of the photo section after about six minutes, I think, uh, will show him debating. This is a very calm, uh, sorry, common uh, uh, pedagogy, a way of learning. This one, thank you, this one. This is His Holiness debating for his Geshe exam in Lhasa in the 1950s. A and around him are other very highly accomplished lamas and geshes who are debating with him. They're going back and forth. It's a Socratic method. This goes on for 20 years until they get their degree, geshe degree, which is like a PhD in philosophy, Buddhist philosophy. Now, this photo shows him in 1956 when he came from Tibet to India and met on his right, our left, uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru. And on his left, our right, Sw Swami Radhakrishna, the first president of India. They immediately became friends. Here is 1989 in Norway, Oslo, when His Holiness is receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay. Let 
Let me say a few words about Paracelsus, because this 24th September is the anniversary of his death, and this lecture series, or this lecture, uh, was supposed to be kind of in tandem with uh, a bit of a memorial to Paracelsus. You heard from Albino that he was a physician, lived about 500 years ago. He was a contemporary of Copernicus, of Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, and also of Martin Luther. And many people likened him to Martin Luther. Many people saw him as a radical of his day. He was actually elected to the dean, post of deanship at uh, the University, I think, of Basel in Switzerland. And in less than a year, uh, he was removed from his seat. And the city of Nuremberg uh, decided to stop printing his texts. He was almost considered a heretic. He thought that to be a good physician, you need to pay attention to the natural world and to observation. He was very much educated and used astrology in his medical practice. When his publications were banned and he lost his position at the University Medical School, he decided to go on to the road. And he became kind of a wandering mendicant in Africa, parts of Europe, and in Asia. And he learned a lot of hidden knowledge from many of these ancient uh, traditions, spiritual traditions in the West and in the East. Finally, um, his book, The Great Surgery, was recognized as something worthwhile was published, and he again regained notoriety. So it's this quality that was likened to Martin Luther to reject the ancient medical uh, teachings. And in fact, there's some uh, suggestion that he actually burnt a lot of these ancient medical texts. So the establishment was not so happy with him, the medical establishment. Um, he had some very interesting theories. Here he's the wandering mendicant. He had some very interesting theories that dated back both to Greek philosophy as well as uh, Buddhist philosophy, though I'm not sure he knew this. He believed in something called the tria prima, which is Latin, which means the three essential principles. And he called these three, uh, they're actually names of elements, physical elements, but he expanded the understanding well beyond. Well beyond the physical world. And so these three principles were called uh, mercury, sulfur, and salt. And mercury for him represented change, represented transformation. The sulfur uh, represented binding of these two other principles, the mercury, change or transformation, and the third, salt, which represented solidity, like the physical universe. So these three essential principles uh, which 
were applied to all of the universe and life, he even applied these pre-principles to the individual. Um, these three... This will be much more comfortable. I was having quite a feedback and a lag, and so I found myself speaking rather unnaturally uh, with the headphones on, which has your Russian, which has your, has the uh, English translation. Um, so th th these three principles, the Greeks had something similar where they, were, where they divided you know, everything in the world into three or four basic principles. In Tibetan medicine, which comes from Buddhism, um, similarly, we have three basic principles. We have tipa, lung, and bege. Okay? Tipa is heat. Um, lung is movement or transformation as mercury represented for Parasolsis, in change or flux. Um, and then thirdly is began, which has to do with kind of cold. It has to do with sort of mucus. It has to do with kind of things being a little bit uh, less active, more sedentary. These three principles. And all Tibetan medicine is based on these three principles. Now, what's very exciting about Tibetan medicine is that these three principles, in turn, are based on, what do you think? Emotions. Please raise your hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. These three principles of all of life, and of health, and of disease, in Tibetan medicine, they're based on emotions, particularly based on desire, you know, strong grasping or attachment, based on anger or pushing away, being very aggressive, and three, based on confusion, doubt, or what we call ignorance, not knowing reality properly. Okay? Uh, so in Tibetan medicine, which comes from Buddhism, this balancing of the body and the mind is integral. It's part of the system. It's recognized as something very natural. In many Western countries and some Eastern countries, including some parts of Russia, there are many young educated people who are finding Buddhism interesting. doesn't mean they're becoming Buddhists. Buddhism doesn't proselytize. In fact, many times when His Holiness the Dalai Lama is teaching in a, a non-Buddhist country, usually a Christian country, he says repeatedly, don't change your religion. But if you find that some things kind of talk to you, they work for you in, the, in your life, they help you to become more calm, more peaceful, then adopt them. He says, please, feel free to adopt them. But he says, don't change your religion. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, more and more young educated people are finding uh, Buddhist principles, particularly the psychology and the philosophy that we talked about, they're finding them very, very interesting. Even uh, rock stars, some of your rock stars here in Russia are probably not Buddhist, I mean maybe they are, but probably not, but they incorporate a lot of Buddhism into their lives and they sing about it, they write about it, they paint about it. It's becoming very, very common. Um, in the West and here, actors, actresses have kind of, some have adopted Buddhism, others have founded a very lovely kind of approach to life. And one of the main reasons that this has happened in the last 30 years uh, is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not quite an ordinary person. An ordinary person like you and me, yeah, 
We're very selfish. Yeah? We're hungry, so we go have to eat. Okay? We're cold, so we have to put on a jacket. Okay? Um, our bottom side is a little sore, so we have to shift our position in our chair. Right? Um, you know, so much me, me, me stuff. Take care of number one. Um, and we don't realize it often that we do that so much. Often it goes kind of on a subliminal level, a level we're not aware of often. Someone like the Dalai Lama, he doesn't do that. His mind, his heart is continually focused on benefiting others. All others. Not just Buddhists. All others. And not just humans. All others. Yeah? Animals, all kinds of life form. Um, the belief uh, in Buddhism is that everything is in flux. Everything is changing. And everything has a cause. So there's actually no beginning. No beginning to the universe. So Buddhism believes in the Big Bang Theory. I mean, the Buddha taught things very similar. Very similar to the Big Bang. But... Uh, Buddhism does not believe, believe that there was just one Big Bang. Because the Buddhists say, what came before? And now, a lot of cosmologists are asking the same question. You know, well, where did the Big Bang come from? They talk about this incredibly dense, incredibly high pressure, high pressure singularity, you know, a point. Well, but where did that come from? <laughs> And now some of the cosmologists are starting to talk about series of Big Bangs. And there are even a few that have thrown out the hypothesis of infinite Big Bangs. This is the Buddhist view. And it was formulated 2,600 years ago. Okay. Um, Darwinian evolution. Very consistent, compatible with the Buddhist understanding of of change. Um, so many principles in science are very compatible with Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist psychology. Okay. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been so actively involved with people, you know, since he was exiled in 1959. Uh, he had to leave because of fear that his life would be, his life was in danger. He had to leave, they thought he would be killed. So he left and uh, was able to get over the high Himalaya mountains safely, alive, and uh, uh, landed in India, and had already met, we sh sh I showed you that slide from 1956, he had already met uh, the Prime Minister and the President, Nehru and Radhakrishna of India, and then when he came again in 59, they granted him asylum so he could stay in India. And it turns out that there are about 100,000 other Tibetans that escaped and live in India also. Okay. He has been uh, such a force in the world, going around giving talks, uh, going around meeting uh, leaders, scientists, He's been very active in interfaith dialogue, not for one or two years, but for probably 30 years, having interfaith dialogues. This is something that he is deeply committed in. And we hope that this new pope uh, <clears throat> will um, be flexible and uh, would like to have a meeting. And so maybe, hopefully the two will meet. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has met previous popes, but... Uh, we hope that this new Pope Francis, there'll be a, an opportunity for the two of them to meet. So he's been very active in inter, uh, inter-religious, inter-faith uh, dialogue and feels this is extremely important. Um, okay. When I talk in Moscow, Actually, all over Russia when I talk, and I was in Krasnodar recently, and Kalmykia, I'll be going to Tuva soon, um, and in Moscow, we've had about four or five days of talks, um, four days, I think. 
We've had many, many questions. People have been very excited about asking questions. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here for now and see if you have any questions. I think we have a microphone, yes. So I'll ask you to stand up and then please come forward. And Albina has the microphone. You can come in, come up and ask your question here, please. Yes, we can ask questions. Now they will put uh, the special microphones. Please uh, ask uh, the questions. Mm -hmm. So now, hello, uh, I have three questions. Do you know the conference uh, Global Future Global Future 2045 that took place in Moscow. Do you know about this conference? I think uh, this is uh, very corresponding to Buddhism. Uh, there were different researchers. Uh, they were uh, studying the uh, uh, speed of uh, trans uh, transportation of information through the uh, informational networks and uh, found out uh, that between uh, 2020 and 2050 uh, there can be a big leap. This conference uh, invited scientists and the religious, and the religious uh, leaders. So I would like uh, to ask, so um, I just wanted, if you knew about this conference, I wanted to ask uh, about your opinion, but uh, you <laughs> so uh, they are just uh, saying that this is not a question actually about the astrology could you please talk about the astrology <laughs> 